the genesis of this conversation, this panel um, on, on uh, marriage, Catholicism, and public policy was an essay uh, written fairly recently uh, by uh, Jody Bottom in Commonweal entitled The Things We Share, A Catholic's Case for Same-Sex Marriage. And given the theme of the conference being embodiment and the nature uh, 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 of the human body and, or the body and human identity, and, the, and the, the sort of dialogue as it's unfolded on the question of marriage, and especially featuring questions of the normativity of the biological relationship between the sexes and how that, how that relates to marriage, we thought that it would be a, a fitting occasion to have a conversation among thoughtful Catholics about the question of marriage, uh, which of course is a vexed uh, public question. Um, and to that end, we will, we will hear from our uh, esteemed Guests, unfortunately, um, Jody, has, uh, who was, whose work was the occasion of this panel, is, very, is sick. He has pneumonia and sends his regrets. We're very sorry that he wasn't able to join us. So what I will do is read excerpts from Jody's piece. And while I'm the moderator of the panel, I will also take, uh, take it upon myself to, to anticipate what Jody's responses might be to some of the lines of criticism that we can anticipate in, this, uh, in, in the course of our conversation. So um, that's, the, that's the process. Uh, I'll introduce our speakers, and then we'll just begin. Uh, first of all, uh, Professor Charles Reed from the, comes to us from the University of St. Thomas School of Law. Uh, he was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He graduated from the University of uh, Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where he majored in Latin, classics, and history. And he also did substantial coursework in classical Greek and modern European languages. It was during his undergraduate days that he developed an interest in canon law doing a year of directed research in Roman and canon law under the supervisions of James Brundage. Uh, Professor Reed then attended Catholic University of America, where he earned a, a Juris Doctorate and a JCL, a license in canon law. Uh, during his time at Catholic U, he organized a series of symposium, uh, symposia on the bishop's pastoral letter on nuclear arms. The proceedings of those symposia were published under Reed's editorship as Peace in a Nuclear Age, the Bishop's Pastoral Letter in Perspective. The book was called by the New York Times among the most scholarly and unsettling of responses to the pastoral letter. Reed then attended Cornell University, where he earned a PhD. Can you please call for a Father Terry Ehrman? Father Terry Ehrman, uh, can you please uh, join this woman uh, immediately? Thank you. <laughs> He's right there. That's Father Terry right there. Professor Reed um, earned a PhD in the history of medieval law under the supervision of Brian Tierney. Uh, his thesis at Cornell was on the Christian medieval origins of the Western concept of individual rights. Over the last 10 years, he's published a number of articles on the history of Western rights thought and is currently completing work on a book manuscript addressing this question. Uh, Professor Reed was also appointed in 1991 a research associate in law and history at the Emory University School of Law, where he worked closely with Harold Berman on the history of Western law. He collaborated with Professor Berman on articles on the Lutheran legal science of the 16th century, the English legal science of the 17th century, and the flawed premise of Max Weber's legal historiography. While at Emory, Professor Reed also pursued a research agenda involving scholarship on the history of Western notions of individual rights, the history of liberty of conscience in America, and the natural law foundations of the jurisprudence of Judge John Noonan. He has also published articles on various aspects of the history of the English common law, he has had the chance to apply legal history in a forensic setting, serving as an expert witness in litigation involving the religious significance of Christian burial. Additionally, Professor Reed has taught a seminar on the contribution of medieval canon law to, uh, to the shaping of Western constitutionalism. Recently, Professor Reed has become a featured blogger at the Huffington Post on current issues where religion, law, and politics intersect. <clears throat> Sharif Gerges, uh, to my right, was born in Cairo and grew up in Delaware. He majored in philosophy at Princeton University, where he won several academic prizes, including the 2007 Dante Prize for the nation's best undergraduate essay on Dante. His senior thesis on sex ethics won the Princeton Prizes for the best thesis in ethics and the best thesis in philosophy. Upon graduating Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude in 2008, he went on to earn a master's degree in moral, political, and legal philosophy at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. He is now pursuing his PhD in philosophy at Princeton and his JD at Yale Law School. His paper, What is Marriage, co-authored with Robert George and Ryan Anderson, was published in December and quickly became 
Social Science Research Network's uh, most downloaded paper of the previous year. In 2012, Gerges, George, and Anderson published an expanded version of the paper as a book titled, What is Marriage, Man and Woman, a Defense? In addition to publishing in more popular contexts, he has given lectures and talks and engaged in debates on marriage and related topics throughout the United States. And finally, Ryan Anderson researches and writes about marriage and religious liberty as the William E. Simon Fellow in Religion and a Free Society at the Heritage Foundation. He also focuses on justice and moral principles and economic thought, healthcare and education, and has expertise in bioethics and natural law theory. Anderson, who joined Heritage's DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society in 2012, is also the editor of Public Discourse, the online journal of the Witherspoon Institute in Princeton, New Jersey. Anderson's recent work focuses on the moral and constitutional questions surrounding same-sex marriage. He is the co-author with Princeton, Robert, Princeton's Robert George and Sarif Gerges, What is Marriage, Man and Woman a Defense? You might have heard about that moments ago. <laughs> Do you not edit these things? <laughs> you sent this to me. So um, uh, the, the, the three also co-wrote the article, uh, What is Marriage, which I also referenced moments ago. <laughs> Anderson, George, and Gerges, which wasn't mentioned a moment ago, did file amicus briefs in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal in Perry versus Schwarzenegger, the case reviewing the constitutionality of California's Proposition 8, which with the First Circuit Court on the challenge to the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. In January of 2013, the co-authors filed a brief at the U.S. Supreme Court after it agreed to hear the cases. Anderson's previous positions include the assistant editor of First Things, journalism fellow of the Phillips Foundation, and executive, editor, uh, executive director sorry, of the Witherspoon Institute, where he was research assistant to Professor Robert P. George and Jean Bethke Elstein. His articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, First Things, Weekly Standard, National Review, Ricochet.com, New Atlantis, Claremont Review of Books, Touchstone, Books and Culture, Christianity Today, The City, and Human Life Review. Anderson received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Princeton University, graduating Phi Beta Kappa and magna cum laude. He is a doctoral candidate. <laughs> <laughs> He's a doctoral candidate in political philosophy at the University of Notre Dame, where he received his master's degree. His research spans the natural law tradition in conversation with classical and contemporary liberalism. The tentative title of his dissertation, Beyond Private Property and Social Welfare, Economic Justice and Economic Rights, he was born in Baltimore and resides in Washington, D.C. We have an esteemed panel. We begin with Professor Reed. Well, Carter, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'd like to thank Ryan uh, Madison for uh, being uh, very helpful early on, and, and my fellow panelists, thank you. I'd like to make a point that is a relatively modest one, and that is the Catholic Catechism should be amended in the subject of same-sex relations to take account of what science can now tell us about same-sex attraction. Paragraphs 2357, 2358 of the Catechism describe same-sex attraction as objectively disordered and same-sex relations as intrinsically disordered. These are passages I should note that Pope Francis has carefully avoided speaking in preference to other passages regarding gays which are more welcoming. I believe that the time has come to remove these passages from the Catechism. Now, I appreciate that the word intrinsically may simply mean that same-sex relations cannot fully express and embody a conception of the sex act that is fully unitive and procreative in its traditional sense. And that the word intrinsic disorder may simply have reference to this philosophical theological dimension of the question. But from a pastoral position, this point is lost on most readers of the catechism. And remember, the, the catechism is intended, it says so in the introduction, as a pastoral tool. What most readers see when they look at these passages is the long and sorry history of the effort to medicalize and treat those deemed afflicted with same-sex attractions. It was not that many years ago when psychologists and psychiatrists used aggressive forms of treatment to try to effectuate cures. I did a recent search on that question, and as recently as 1973, now this seems to be the very last of its kind, uh, but it, it's the very, uh, still 1973, the Journal of Abnormal Psychology uh, asserts evidence for the success of certain aggressive treatments such as the use of electric shock and aversive therapy. Now, that's not the electric shock therapy of the classic sort where you, 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 you put something on someone's head, but it is shocking people whenever they have unwanted thoughts in the hope of conditioning them to adopt a different more socially approved set of sexual attractions. 
The catechism sources certainly have roots in this older, now discredited approach to same-sex attraction. I'll consider two roots in particular. The, the first is a document uh, is, uh, called Persona Humana, issued by the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith in 1975. The second is the, uh, it, it was issued uh, in 86 by the CDF, the letter to the bishops and the pastoral care of homosexual persons. But I'll begin with Persona Humana. It, it is immersed in this psychological history, and its opening lines it acknowledges a debt to contemporary scientific research, which has shown that the human person is so profoundly affected by sexuality that it must be considered one of the factors which give every individual's life their principal traits and, to, and distinguishing it. Having acknowledged the debt to science, Persona Humana goes on to discuss same-sex attraction as I, reflecting either curable or incurable tendencies. And uh, curable tendencies include false education, lack of normal sexual development, habit, bad example, other similar causes. On the other hand, there are certain matters that are incurable. These arise from a kind of innate, instinctive, or pathological constitution. And, and persona humana uh, advises understanding when dealing with people, but uh, it cautions individuals never to act on these impulses. For persona humana warns in sacred scripture, they are condemned as a serious depravity and even presented the sad consequence of rejecting God. Um, footnote 142 of the Catechism acknowledges that when it uses its intrinsically disordered language, it is borrowing directly from persona humana. I don't think you can present clear evidence of a connection between the Catechism and, this older uh, and the way this older body of scientific literature was appropriated uh, by the Catholic Church in the 1970s. A and um, so in 1975, we still see this. But now if uh, moving forward, let's move forward to the letter to the bishops of the Catholic Church and the pastoral care of homosexual persons. And this letter uh, declares that uh, there is a category of persons for whom the homosexual orientation is not the result of deliberate choice. Uh, the interestingly, they, uh, it assumes without saying so much that perhaps some people do choose this lifestyle. But such persons uh, lack, lack freedom. And since they lack freedom, uh, the pastoral letter says, they lack culpability. And in fact, the letter concedes, and uh, there may be circumstances that exist now or may have exist, existed in the past which reduce or remove the culpability of the individual in a, given in a given instance. Now, this is a truly remarkable advance from the perspective of persona humana. It acknowledges a reality well known to psychological and psychiatric communities, and it balances what we know scientifically with what we can be expected what can be expected from an individual uh, morally. It stresses as well that gays must never be the subject of violent malice and should always be respected in their intrinsic dignity. Now, if this were the, 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 if the pastoral letter had stopped there, we could applaud its progressive tendencies. Uh, but that is not all there is. In paragraph three, uh, the letter looks explicitly to persona humana for its distinction between the homosexual condition in individual homosexual actions. The first is a more or less strong tendency ordered toward an intrinsic moral evil. The second category then uh, consists of sexual acts among persons of the same gender, and this falls into the category of intrinsically disordered. And then to describe the evil at stake, the letter looks to scripture and theology. Paragraph six, we encounter a scriptural uh, lesson, beginning with the story of the men of Sodom, the letter notes there can be no doubt of the moral judgment there against homosexual relations. Uh, indeed, scripture scholars, on the other hand, uh, argue that there may be quite a quarrel over that particular text. But that's, so we may save that for later. The, the letter uses this reference as, back, as backdrop for interpreting St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Uh, which lists those who behave in a homosexual fashion among those who shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. In Romans, the letter continues, Paul uses homosexual behavior as an, as an example of the blindness which has overcome mankind. And 1 Timothy, the letter states, is in full continuity with the biblical position when it explicitly names as sinners those who engage in homosexual acts. 
This is a strong scriptural tradition, but there are other strong scriptural traditions which Catholic rightly, Catholics rightly reject on the basis of an, an evolving hermeneutical approach to sacred texts. Certainly the writer of the letter anticipated this objection and proposed as well a theological and philosophical defense of the church's position. That theology is grounded in Genesis and, and an understanding of the creator's sexual design. This is where the unitive and procreative elements are introduced into the debate. Homosexual activity is not a complementary union able to transmit life. And so it thwarts the call to life, of, to a life of that form of self-giving which the gospel says is the essence of Christian living. This theology rests upon a particular assumption about the nature and design of the human person. It relies, if you will, on a certain poetry of creation. Our bodies are naturally ordered and inclined to combine and promote unitive and procreative coupling and sex acts which defeat that poetry should be labeled and opposed as intrinsically disordered. But at, at this point, my inclination is to summarize what we have reviewed with an eye towards seeing how the catechism might be nudged in a different direction. Let's begin by noting that the catechism, which borrows from these earlier sources, depends, like its sources, on what science says about same-sex attraction. Humana, humana persona and the, letter, the pastoral letter both explicitly invoke science as a foundation to their reasoning. Now, if science is that important, then we should follow where science leads. And science is increasingly clear that same-sex attraction is a fixed aspect of certain individuals' personalities. It's a mad, matter of natural human variability. While scientists still do not fully understand its causes, it is clear that same-sex attraction is, not a natural, it is a naturally occurring phenomenon and that it should not be treated in, in any sense that it's harmful. It, it, it's benign. And openness to science in turn allows us to reconsider another fundamental aspect in all these documents, and that is the design of the creator. What did the creator intend? Uh, can we come up with a theology that uh, might at the same time remove this intrinsic disordered language and still re remain consistent to creative design? And here I think you can uh, presuppose or you, you can propose the creator has designed a creation in which some individuals have a same-sex attraction while others do not. A and that seems to be the, the growing consensus of science uh, throughout the Western world. I have studies in my notes from Australia, from uh, New Zealand, from Canada, uh, from Europe and the United States. Uh, and so how is it that, sec that uh, attraction, sexual, uh, same sex, sexual attraction is intrinsically disordered? Is it like, for instance, addiction to drugs, which always causes problems for its victims? Science in increasingly, vehemently, forcefully says, no, it is not. Like heterosexual attractions, it can lead to problems, but these problems are not intrinsic to the attraction. They, they may be simply sinful flaws in the human condition. Then how is same-sex attraction intrinsically disordered? And that gets us into the question of theology. And uh, theology, which may, I, I, I will propose, remain open to scientific insight. But at this point, uh, I've probably gone on too long already, and I'll yield the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Reed. Uh, Mr. Gerges. <clears throat> sure. Well, uh, let me start by saying uh, thanks to Professor Reed and to, uh, to Carter, especially, for inviting us, uh, to my magna cum laude colleague, <laughs> Ryan Anderson, as well. It's great to be on the stage with you. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, this, is, this is a real treat for all of us. Ryan and I especially uh, have had in the last year or so lots of undeserved honors, and this is one of the, th this is the best. Uh, Piers Morgan was pretty good. Yeah, yeah that's right. Go sit, go sit in the audience, Ryan. <laughs> I guess my, my, my best undeserved honor was that uh, Gabby Speech, a, a, an alumna of this university, said yes to me. She always asks at the end of a... She, I just remember that because she always asks when I come back from a talk, like, did you find a way to mention me? <laughs> and so I've, I found a way to mention her. Uh, <laughs> subtle. <laughs> uh, all right, well, it, it might sound like the first uh, contribution on, on the question of the catechism is unrelated to the, the focus of our talk today, which is marriage, Catholicism, and public policy. But I actually don't think that it is. I think it segues very nicely into it. And uh, I'll start by making a few 
points of response to what Professor Reed said and then expand, uh, move on to the expanded topic. The first question is a very simple one, which is whether the language of intrinsically disordered or objectively disordered in that part of the catechism is a pastoral blunder. And on that general question, which I think is mainly prudential, I'm certainly open to the suggestion that a reworking of the language uh, would be good. But I'd like to make a few points. First, within a few lines of that same paragraph, or within a few paragraphs of that one, we have another paragraph in the catechism that says that the acts of self-stimulation are intrinsically, or objectively disordered. And so the desire for those is intrinsically disordered. So I think read in context, it's clear that this isn't a condemnation of a class of human beings, um, but a statement about uh, um, the, moral, the moral status of, of certain acts, and by extension from that, the moral status of certain desires uh, for those acts. In general, if you stay, take a step back from those paragraphs and ask, well, does the Catholic Church have good news for people with same-sex attractions? And I think uh, the answer is the Catholic Church has the best news for people with same-sex attractions as it does for, for anyone, because it tells everybody the same good news, which is the gospel, which is the good news about our origin and about our present vocation and about our destiny. We're not just, in the best human case, the, the effusion of the love of man and woman, the embodiment of their own union in the marital act, but Revelation tells us and the Gospel tells us we are, in a very direct way, a kind of effusion of the love of the inner life of the Trinity, that, that, that we're an outflow of that creative love. So we have dignity as, member, as people made in the image and likeness of God, and not just flowing from the inner life of, of God in that sense, but called to return to him in a very special way, which relates to the present vocation, that whatever our cross is, whatever our difficulties, uh, there is some ray of the divine light that our life alone can reflect. There's some task, some practical work to be done in this world on behalf of Christ that Christ needs each of the baptized to do. And looking to our destiny, that at the end of the day, our most fundamental identity is not as gay or straight or male or female or member of this or that family or household, but again, as children of God, uh, destined for his household and for the glory of his kingdom, which we will have contributed to. So I think, in general, the gospel is good news and very good news for people with same-sex attractions as much as anybody else. And so the church has nothing to be embarrassed about when it comes to that. And if that needs to be better reflected in those passages of the catechism, that's fine. The question that begins to bring us to the marriage debate in particular is what the basis for that proposition is, however it's best expressed pastorally. The proposition that same-sex sexual acts are immoral. Uh, I think it's actually quite clear that the basis of that judgment is not a scientific assumption. It certainly doesn't follow from the fact that a certain desire is uh, genetically rooted that it is right to act on. I mean, there, there's very good evidence that there's a genetic basis for the desire for multiple partners. It's called the, the Y chromosome. And it's <laughs> quite clear. <laughs> it's quite clear that that itself doesn't entail anything yet about the moral status of multiple partner uh, relationships. And of course, when we zoom out from the sexual context, we realize that all of our bad inclinations uh, might well have some kind of physiological basis. That's a consequence of the fall. It doesn't answer the question of whether it is good news or bad news to act on those inclinations. So what is the basis of the judgment that same-sex sexual relationships are immoral? I don't think it's that there two men can't love each other or two women can't love each other, but that love has to respond to the truth about the beloved and about the form of union that the two share. And that whenever you have the experience of a sexual uh, relationship, whenever you have sexual satisfaction, you have the experience of total union with the beloved. And so you must have the reality of total union with the beloved. And where you don't have that reality, whether it's because you don't have a total commitment or because you might have a commitment but you don't have a total union in the sense of uniting heart, mind, and body because it's not a true bodily union, or some other aspect, then what you have is the experience of marriage without the good of marriage, and it's that which is a divide within the person. It fails to respect the truth about the kind of love that these people can have, and it's that failure 
to reflect the truth about love that makes it a sin. But it's a sin in the same way whatever the basis for the deviation from marriage is. In other words, it's because these acts are non-marital that they are immoral. And that brings us to the main focus of our discussion today. What makes a marriage? What kind, why can't the relationship of two men be a marriage? And this is something on which Professor Reed has also written. He, one of his uh, pieces in the Huffington Post was a defense of his own change of mind on the issue from years of advocating what Ryan and I in our work call the conjugal view of marriage as an inherently male-female relationship uh, to really seeing um, at least the social value of recognizing same-sex relationships as marriages. And what he makes there is a very uh, condensed form of a very common argument we hear, which is that marriage is mainly about a certain kind of love or a certain kind of affection. And when he poses for himself the challenge of how do you distinguish this kind of love from others, he says it's by the strength of it. It's a matter of degree. And this, I think, is the kernel that's at the heart of every case for, or at least every sort of worked out case for recognizing same-sex relationships as marriages. It sees marriage as distinguished from other forms of relationship primarily by the intensity of the emotional bond. And I think before you get to any scientific studies, before you get to Genesis or Exodus or Paul, before you get uh, even to the social harms of enshrining one or another view of marriage, you can see that that vision gets marriage wrong. It can't explain things that people on both sides of the marriage debate are very happy to accept. So for example, most people on both sides of the debate think part of what makes marriage special, different from other forms of friendship, is that it's inherently a relationship of two and only two. But if what makes a marriage is a certain kind of emotional union, there's no reason of principle that three people, for example, can't have that. Marriage is uh, inherently the kind of relationship that to get off the ground at all, you have to have a permanent commitment. People on both sides tend to agree with that. But even that can't be explained. It can't, you can't explain why you should pledge permanence as opposed to being together as long as love lasts, where love means a certain kind of emotional regard. I think the same thing is true for sexual exclusivity. It's true for some people by temperament or taste that exclusivity will foster, enhance, maybe stabilize the emotional bond. But some people report that quite the opposite is true for them, that actually having a sexually open relationship by design makes the emotional union stronger and longer lasting. I don't think we have any way of explaining why that's not a marriage if emotional union is what makes it. And the last thing, probably the most common assumption on both sides, is the sense that marriage is an inherently sexual relationship. And even that, I think, becomes arbitrary if what really makes the bond is the intensity of the emotional union. It's true that sex is great for doing that, but there are other ways of becoming emotionally intimate, and there's no reason of principle to say that two women in a platonic bond, not sexually interested in each other, but who share all the burdens and benefits of domestic life, um, have made a marriage on this view. So permanence and exclusivity and monogamy and sexual union, and even for that reason, and in any inherent connection to family life, none of these things can be made sense of on the view of marriage that's behind the push for redefinition, what Ryan and I call the revisionist view, what Professor Reed has advocated uh, more recently. And uh, it can't make sense of any of those. Now, you might ask, well, who cares? Why not recognize them anyway? And, and Ryan will speak to some of the social consequences of replacing one view of marriage with another in our law. But I want to end briefly by just sketching a conception of the alternative. Right? You might ask, well, what is this other view that unites all of these aspects of marriage. We call it again the conjugal view, and we summarize it by the idea of comprehensive union. I think it has some parallels, for example, with the idea of total self-gift in uh, John Paul's thought. Comprehensive union, meaning that in all the ways that make a relationship at all, you know, some kind of common activity, some kind of cooperation towards common ends in the context of a commitment, it's in those dimensions that marriage, the union called marriage, is comprehensive. So it's comprehensive in the way that it unites the partners, right? Most of our friendship, well, all of our friendships as such are unions of heart and mind. You come to know and seek the other person's good. Marriage, everybody seems to agree, has bodily union as a key part of it. And this goes right to the topic of this conference. If we are really embodied, if we are bodily beings, 
And what makes conjugal union is that it seeks comprehensive or total union with the beloved. Then in order to have that, you have to have bodily union. Otherwise, you're leaving a key dimension of the person out. And what makes for bodily union? It's not just a metaphor. We think you can understand it by analogy to the union of parts within a person. So what makes my heart and lungs and other parts one body, one flesh, is that they're all actively coordinated together towards a single end of the whole that they make up, which is my biological life. And the amazing thing is that that kind of radical and real bodily union is possible between two people, but just with respect to reproduction. It's only in the sexual act, in the marital act, that a man and a woman themselves, like the parts of a single person, are actively coordinated towards a single end of the whole that they make up together. Uh, and so it's in that that they're united heart, mind, and body. So it's comprehensive in that sense. It's comprehensive in the range of goods that it unites a couple with respect to. It's not just knowledge like at a university. It's not just sport like on a team. It's the whole range of goods. And, and most people see this as a connection to family life and so to the full range of cooperation that you have in, at the home. But what makes marriage united, oriented to that wide range sharing? Well, in the marital act, the very act that makes marital love concrete is also the kind of act that makes new life. And so marriage itself, the relationship embodied by that act, is fulfilled by, points towards, would be extended and enriched by the wide range sharing of home life that's uniquely fit for family life. And if you've got comprehensive union in that, those two senses, it's one flesh in the dimensions of the partners united, one life that they're united with respect to, then it calls for comprehensive commitment. And comprehensive commitment through time means permanence, and at any given time means exclusivity. So now in this one idea of comprehensive union, what the biblical tradition calls one flesh union, but what you find intimations of in Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and Xenophanes and Masonius Rufus and Plutarch, as in some cases Professor Reed himself has written, is this idea that unites sexual union and permanence and exclusivity and monogamy and family life. All the things that the revisionist view of marriage would tend to tear apart. That's the alternative view. The question in this debate is not whom to let marry, it's, not what, it's really what marriage is, what vision of marriage to enshrine in the law. And in this pastoral context that Professor Reed started with, the question is not, are two people, is a man attracted to other men also a child of God? Of course he is. That's the good news of the gospel. The question is, when he loves another man, what forms can that love take that are true to the reality of who they are and what kind of union they can have? And if they can't have a comprehensive union, then seeking the experience of one is a distortion of the truth and therefore of love. And the true uh, understanding of marital union is of comprehensive union, which explains the, mer the moral views, but also, as Ryan will discuss, explains the social interest that the state has in this kind of relationship. Uh, Thank you. So, Carter, could yeah, please. I just uh, say a couple of words? Sure, yeah, go given? ahead. OK. Yeah. I, I just want to say first uh, that, that regarding marriage as uh, consisting primarily of affection, and that being a matter of degree, I should say that St. Augustine says that the first property of marriage is friendship between the spouses. Indeed, St. Augustine concedes that there are many instances where, children, where, where couples may remain childless, and indeed they may renounce the sex act altogether. Uh, and uh, so limit uh, the, the uh, procreative dimension of marriage. So uh, the, the, there is a certain tenuousness to, to the to that particular argument, uh, it, within the tradition itself. Uh, and um, if, if procreation is, is that transcendent a good, uh, why do we allow the infertile to marry? I mean, they do not, uh, uh, Im, they do not come together to form, uh, to, to bring about children. They're obviously infertile. So why do we allow them to marry? Um, and. Um, then finally, the tendency, genetic tendency to multiple partners. I mean, that's the difference, you know. Uh, so we, uh, that goes right back, uh, I'm afraid, to the old idea of, uh, of negative stereotyping of gay people. That, that they're intrinsic, they, this is an intrinsic disorder. They're, they're like people that have multiple partners. That, that's, uh, I, I find that troubling. I'm going to go ahead and uh, we'll have uh, ample okay. opportunity for further exchange. Thank you, Professor Reed.
Uh, I'm going to read excerpts from uh, the essay that, that inspired this, this, uh, the, us to, to, to engage this particular question from um, Jody Bottom. And, it's a pre and the reason that this essay was provocative was because Jody Bottom had, for many years, in his post at First Things, as the editor in other venues, had, had, uh, had uh, taken an opposite view, had taken the view that uh, same-sex marriage should not be legalized, or, or to use different terminology, that same-sex marriage um, uh, should be, uh, is, is not an appropriate understanding of what marriage rightly is. So uh, let me read from Jody's piece. That, <clears throat> and it's primarily a prudential argument. That ship of the, legally, of the legality of same-sex marriage has already sailed as well it ought to have. By July 2013, 13 states had already recognized it, and under any principle of governmental fairness available today, the equities are all on the side of same-sex marriage. There is no coherent jurisprudential argument against it, no principled legal view that can resist it. The Supreme Court more or less punted this June in its marriage cases Hollingsworth versus Perry and the United States versus Windsor, but it was a punt that signaled eventual victory for the advocates of same-sex marriage. And by ruling in Windsor that Section 3 of DOMA, that is the Defense of Marriage Act, is unconstitutional, the justices made it clear that the court will not stand in the way of the movement's complete triumph. We are now at the point where I believe, that is, the author believes, American Catholics should accept the state recognition of same-sex marriage simply because they are Americans. For that matter, plenty of practical concerns suggest that the bishops should cease to fight the passage of such laws. Campaigns against same-sex marriage are hurting the church, offering the opportunity to make Catholicism a byword for repression in a generation that, even among young Catholics, just doesn't think that same-sex activity is worth fighting about. There's a reasonable case to be made that the struggle against abortion is slowly winning, but the fight against public acceptance of same-sex behavior has been utterly lost. I find these practical considerations compelling, just as I think most ordinary Catholics do. The church in America today is in its weakest public position since agitation about Irish and Italian immigration in the 1870s prompted 38 states to pass anti-Catholic Blaine amendments to their constitutions. A great deal of goodwill was built up by Catholic work in the 1980s and 90s from John Paul II's successful campaign to, quote, live in truth by opposing Soviet communism to the prestige of Mother <coughs> Teresa's work with the poorest in India. But the goodwill disappeared in a flash just over a decade ago with the Boston Globe's 2002 stories of the horrifying priest scandals. Prudential and practical concerns direct how one fights in public, but not why one fights. If a legal regime is wrong, then it's wrong. And however much the culture despises and punishes those who resist its judgments, somebody needs to rise up and say we're going to hell in a handbasket if that is indeed where the culture seems to be going. The bishops are not going to be convinced to end their hopeless fight by some causal or casual appeal to cultural consensus or a feel-good call to join the winning side. And if we appreciate a willingness to be countercultural, how can we ask them to do so for those reasons? Where we're going with all this is toward a claim that the thin notions of natural law deployed against same-sex marriage in recent times are unpersuasive, and what's more, they deserve to be unpersuasive, for their thinness reflects their lack of rich truth about the spiritual meanings present in this created world. Indeed, once the sexual revolution brought the enlightenment to sex, demythologizing and disenchanting the Western understanding of sexual intercourse, the legal principles of equality and fairness were bound to win, as they have over the last decade, the only principles the culture has left with which to discuss topics such as marriage. And so, I argue, a concern about the government's recognizing of same-sex marriage ought to come low on the list of its priorities as the church pursues the evangelizing of the culture. For that matter, after the long, hard work of restoring cultural sensitivity to the metaphysical meanings reflected in all of reality, Catholics will have enough experience to decide what measure of the deep spirituality of nuptials, almost absent in the present culture, can reside in same-sex unions. But before we reach for those conclusions, there remains, I think, a question religious believers must ask, a prior question of whether the current agitation really derives from a wish for same-sex marriage or whether the movement is an excuse for a larger campaign to delegitimize and undermine Christianity. One wonders what the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, led by the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., would have, ha would have had to say about this interpretation of the civil rights movement as fundamentally an overcoming of Christianity. But if that's what same-sex marriage movement is really about, the redefinition of history as Christian oppression, the rereading of even success stories like the civil rights movement as tales of defeating Christian evil, all for the purpose of cutting off the religious roots of Western civilization, then to hell with it. 
We could probably work up an indictment of the media, identity politics, and the grievance industry for this perception, as Bauer himself has in other contexts, turning even slight de deviations from the accepted position into occasions for full-blown accusations of bigotry, but why bother? Hot or cold, the water in which we find ourselves is the water in which we have to swim. The Catechism of the Catholic Church makes a distinction between same-sex orientation and same-sex activity that might have once seemed intelligible, even commonsensical. But the distinction has absolutely no purchase today. And what good does it do to complain, as does, for example, Ryan Anderson, right here, the sharpest of the younger, uh, the sharpest of the younger <laughs> activists, now working against same-sex marriage, that the distinction somehow ought to have purchase. If we allow divorce, then we have already weakened the thick mystical notions of marriage vows. Adultery is an everyday sin. Divorce is something more, a denial of a solemn oath made to God. I'm not trying to argue here directly for an end to the culture's embrace of legalized divorce, much as the sociological evidence about the harm to children now appears beyond dispute. Rather, the point is that the legal and social acceptance of divorce, building in Protestant America from the late 19th century on, culminated in the universal availability of no-fault divorce. And if heterosexual monogamy so lacks the old, enchanted metaphysical foundation that it can end in quick and painless divorce, then what principle allows a refusal of marriage to gaze on the ground of a metaphysical notion like the difference between man and woman? Think of the parallel with laws against sodomy. If marriage is nothing more than a licensed sexual playground without any sense of sin attached to oral sex and anal sex and almost any other act, then under what intellectually coherent scheme can one refuse others the opportunity to the same behavior? The goal of the church today must primarily be the reenchantment of reality. Is sex the place in which that project of reenchantment ought to begin? I just can't see it. The campaign for traditional marriage really isn't a defense of natural law. It revealed itself in the end as a defense of one of the last little remaining bits of Christendom, an entanglement or at least an accommodation of church and state. The logic of the Enlightenment took a couple of hundred years to get around to eliminating that particular portion of Christendom, but the deed is done now. Same-sex marriage might prove a small advance in chastity in a culture that has lost much sense of chastity. Same-sex marriage might prove a small advance in love in a civilization that no longer seems to know what love is for. Same-sex marriage might prove a small advance in the coherence of family life in a society in which the family is dissolving. I don't know that it will, of course, and some of the most persuasive statements of conservatism insist that we should not undertake projects, the consequences of which we cannot foresee. But same-sex marriage is already here. It's not as though we can halt it. And other profound statements of conservatism remind us that we must take people as we find them, must instruct the nation where the nation is. For that matter, the argument about unforeseen consequences is a sword that cuts both ways. Precisely because human social experience has never recognized same-sex marriage on any large scale, we don't know the extent to which metaphysical meanings, the enchantment of marriage, can be instantiated in same-sex unions. And finally, we can't predict the effects of same-sex marriage. I hope some good will come, but I cannot say with certainty that all must go well with this social change. Still, as the church turns to other and far more pressing ways to re-enchant the world, we'll have time to find out. And with that, Mr. Anderson. Do you want me to do this from the front row? <laughs> Here's Morgan. We respect you more than he does. You can stay seated on the same level as, as us. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so Jody is my former boss at First Things, so I was actually uh, looking forward to this, because I think uh, lots of parts of his essay are actually quite insightful um, and are quite um, accurate as to the cultural situation. I just think his conclusion is exactly uh, opposite of what we should be drawing from this. Uh, rather than giving up on marriage, it should actually encourage all Catholics to get more engaged in the defense of marriage, precisely because of why marriage matters. Uh, so in the time I have today, I just want to pick up where Sharif left off and say a little bit about why I think it matters uh, for policy and for public law what the definition of marriage is. Um, the very first sentence that Carter read from Jody's essay mentioned equity, equality. And at one point, Jody said that equality and fairness after the sexual revolution requires redefining marriage. Um, I think the left has been very good at sloganeering. Their slogan fits on a bumper sticker. It's marriage equality. Conjugal union doesn't quite have the same, same ring. <laughs> Uh, if you want to make a bumper sticker that says conjugal union, I don't know if anyone will know what you're talking about. But the problem with marriage equality um, is that everyone in this debate is for marriage equality. The debate's precisely over what marriage is, 
we all want the law to treat every marriage in the same way. We want the law to recognize every real marriage as a marriage. And so the question, therefore, is how do you define what marriage is and why it matters? Because even on the revisionist view of marriage, some relationships, some consenting adult loving relationships, will not be counted as a marriage. They're going to have to draw lines as well. And so the question is, what lines are drawn on a principled basis? The answer that Sharif gave began to draw a, a philosophical, metaphysical account of what marriage is that would draw those lines around comprehensive union, uh, where uh, sexually complementary spouses unite in a comprehensive way that's oriented towards a comprehensive array of goods and demands a comprehensive commitment. So I just want to say a word about why policy should care about this. Um, first thing to say is that government's not in the marriage business because it cares about our love lives. If marriage is just about consenting adult romance, we could take the state out of the bedroom. And so it's interesting that those in favor of redefining marriage are trying to put government in more bedrooms. The question is why? Why is government really concerned about my love life or Sharif's love life? When he gets married to Gabby this summer, why does the government care? And it's not because they're suckers for romance, that they love Jane Austen novels or something like that. <laughs> Although maybe they, in Cherie's case, Mr. <laughs> Darcy. Um, but the reason the government's in the marriage business is that the union of a man and a woman can produce a new life. And that new child needs to be raised to maturity in a semi-decent way to be a semi-decent, law-abiding, productive member of society. And so from a government's perspective, they're in the marriage business to incentivize, to maximize the likelihood that a man and a woman commit to each other as husband and wife to then be mother and father to any children that their union produces. It's based on the biological, uh, the anthropological truth that men and women are distinct and complementary, biological fact that reproduction requires a man and a woman, and the social reality that children deserve a mother and a father. And the question for policy is how can we maximize the likelihood that this takes place in a non-coercive way? Because we don't want to be coercing people to you know, get together and raise their kids, and we don't want to be uh, uh, penalizing or, or uh, criminalizing certain actions. Uh, so Jody is also wrong when he talks about how can we deny people the ability to form certain relationships? They're free to form certain relationships. The question is, will the government be calling this a marriage? Uh, Maggie Gallagher likes to say that when a baby is born, a mother will always be close by. That's a fact of biology. The question for culture and the question for law is, will a father be close by? And if so, for how long? And one of the things that marriage as a legal institution does that we see across time and space throughout history and across the globe that it's an institution that's trying to maximize the likelihood that that man commits to that woman, and then the two of them take responsibility for that child. Part of this is also based on the truth. There's no such thing as parenting in the abstract. There's mothering and there's fathering. So part of our embodiment as male and female, as man and woman, as husband and wife, is that there's mothering, fathering. Moms do typical things for children. Fathers do other uh, complementary things for children. It's not to say that there are any sort of like uh, normative gender type stereotypes for parenting, that only fathers can do X, Y, Z, and only mothers can do PDQ, but it's to say that on average and for the most part, if I was to ask you, Saturday morning, someone's wrestling on the living room carpet with Bruno and Carlo, teaching them how to be masculine but not to be violent, to use headlocks but not to bite or to gouge eyes or to pull hair, chances are it's Carter. <laughs> on average and for the By the way, Bruno and Carlo are my children, just to be clear about that. <laughs> <laughs> the term thruple will come up later, but it's not about that. Uh, yeah, so on average, for the most part, it's something that a father does for his boys. And it's why we then see reflected in the social science that young boys who grow up without a father are more likely to commit crime. Because one of the things that fathers do for boys is help them uh, channel their masculine desires uh, in a way that's not violent, but that is kind of masculine. One of the things that fathers do for girls is to help scare away bad boyfriends and to model what a good relationship looks like with a woman. It's not to say that uh, the mother can't do that, but it's to say that on average and for the most part, the father is the one that's kind of policing uh, his daughter's uh, romantic relationships and also modeling for his daughter what a good romantic relationship looks like by treating his wife in a good way. Um, so again, part of this is that state's interest here is that we don't have androgyny. Men and women are different. The type of union that they form can create new life. The state has an interest in seeing that this new life goes well. Which is ultimately to say that the state cares about marriage not because of its private uh, aspects, its personal aspects, its loving aspects, but its public significance. And its public significance is as an institution that's ultimately geared towards 
creating and then rearing that next generation of citizens. Uh, there's a quote when I give the longer version of this talk that I normally read through just to give you a sense of the statistics. It's from President Obama. President Obama says, we know the statistics that children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of schools, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. They're more likely to have behavioral problems or run away from home or become teenage parents themselves. And the foundations of our community are weaker because of it. So I like to say that the response to the marriage equality um, uh, slogan is one about social justice. And that ultimately the family is the primary institution of social justice. Before you get to the state, before you get to the market, before you get to the church, it's the family that sets the focal case of a social justice institution. And what the states tries to do in a non-coercive way is to get men and women to commit to each other so that children have moms and dads. And it does this without criminalizing other types of relationships. So in all 50 states right now, two men or two women can live with each other and love each other. They can go to a progressive church and have a wed wedding ceremony performed. They can work for a liberal business and receive marriage benefits if the church chooses to perform that ceremony and if the business chooses to give those benefits. What's at stake with the redefinition of marriage is whether or not the coercive force of law will redefine marriage as a public institution and then force every business into treating a same-sex relationship as if it's a marriage and force most religious institutions, not clergy on Sunday mornings, but more or less every other religious institution into treating a same-sex relationship as if it's a marriage. And what we argue in the book as far as the social justice consequences of this are that there are three reasons why we think. Jody says we can't predict what the outcomes will be. We actually think you can look at the logic of this, and ideas have consequences, and with fairly good reliability, you can predict where the logic of redefining marriage takes you. So I'll just close with saying three things about why I think it'll be a social injustice to redefine marriage and how it'll hurt the least well-off, the most vulnerable amongst us. Uh, the first is what it would mean for the public message of marriage. Uh, the second point will be where further redefinition of marriage will take us. And then the third will be a comment about religious liberty, uh, especially since I think the church is the second institution of social justice. So first, uh, the public message. If you redefine marriage, to say that a same-sex couple is the same thing as a marriage, you're more or less teaching the signal that two moms or two dads is the same thing as a mom and a dad. And it'll be very hard to teach that fathers are essential when you've redefined marriage to make fathers optional. So the biggest social problem we face right now in America is that uh, it's something like 40% of children on average across the United States grow up without a father, 50% of Latinos grow up without a father, and over 70% of African-American children grow up without a dad. You care about social justice for those kids, you want to increase the likelihood that their fathers will be involved in their lives. Redefining marriage does nothing to send that signal. If anything, it, does, it sends a signal that fathers are optional, that fathers are not a necessary ingredient to a well-functioning family life for a child. And it's not so much that our primary concern is what a gay or a lesbian couple, um, uh, what sort of parents they will be. We have no doubt that gays and lesbians can love children. Our primary concern is what the law will teach. There will be no institution in public life that teaches even as an ideal that a child deserves a mom and a dad, and that the ideal for children is to have the man and the woman who create the child commit to each other permanently and exclusively to then raise that child. One of the things that we saw, and Jody mentions this in his article, he says, oh, after no-fault divorce, we just have to throw in the towel and give up on marriage. We think the exact opposite. The lesson of no-fault divorce is that the law teaches, that the law shapes culture, Culture, in turn, shapes all of our beliefs, and then our beliefs shape our action. Prior to the introduction of no-fault divorce, under common law and under uh, early American law, divorce was something that you had to have sue for with grounds. You had grounds for divorce, and in the common law, you had the three A's, abuse, abandonment, and adultery. These were serious reasons to get out of your marriage. Your spouse was abusing you, your spouse had committed adultery, your spouse had abandoned you. The expectation in the law that was that marriage was a permanent relationship. And that only for these very grave, very serious reasons would the law grant a divorce. With the introduction of no-fault divorce, we saw divorce rates go from single digits to nearly 50%. Nearly half of marriages at the peak after the introduction of no-fault divorce were ending in, in, in divorce. Because the law was now teaching that marriage need not even have an expectation of permanency. That you can get out of your marriage contract for lighter reasons than you can with your roofer or your plumber. Your legal obligations to your carpenter are in many states stronger than your legal obligations to your spouse. So if you think the law teaches, and I think we have very good reasons to think that the law does teach, 
uh, redefining marriage to make it an androgynous institution, to make fathers optional, be very hard with the type of message. President Obama's, the quote that I read was from his Father's Day address. Because Fre President Obama has been great about speaking out the importance on fathers because he grew up without his father. And he says this is what inspires him to be a good dad to his two daughters. It will be very hard for the law to teach that message. Second point has to do with the redefinition of marriage and how it will continue. And, and this is where the term thruple uh, will come up. I'll, I'll introduce you to three new words that we came across while doing research for the book. Uh, and actually, one of them came up after the book was published. We actually made a prediction about this. And we were actually, between the time that we wrote the article to the time of the book till today, every one of the things that we predicted would happen has actually now come to pass, um, if not in law, at least uh, as far as the advocates go. Um, as Sharif argued, once you uh, say that the union of a man and a woman is arbitrary and irrational, something just based on bigotry and animus, it's very hard to see what legal principle is left to say that marriage should be a monogamous institution, or a sexually exclusive institution, or a permanent institution. The way that we arrived at monogamy in Western life and Western law was that the union of one man and one woman can produce a new life, and every child has one mother and one father. So if the male-female aspect of marriage is irrational and arbitrary, what's so principled about the number two? What's magical about the number two? And what legal argument would you make if you're in the Supreme Court and Sharif Carter and I came before you and said, you're denying us our marriage equality. We're in a thruple. A thruple is a three-person couple. We have joint bank accounts. All of our names are in the deed of our house. We love each other. We care for each other. Uh, we've pledged our lives to each other. Why are you denying our marriage equality? Once you say the male-female aspect of marriage is irrational and arbitrary, what's magical about twosomes? And that's just a question going forward. And we've already seen, so the term thruple was one of the terms that we came across while doing research for this, and it's just a three-person couple. Uh, the next term we came across was monogamish. Uh, this is a term from Dan Savage. And there was a New York Times Saturday profile of Savage. He, he's the um, founder of the It Gets Better campaign, uh, sex advice columnist, and a, uh, a very vocal supporter of the redefinition of marriage to include same-sex couples. And the profile of him was saying, here's one of the things that straight couples can learn from gay couples. And he said it was the virtue of sexually open relationships. So he retains monogamy, so it's a two-person relationship. But the term he coined was monogamish, monogamish, in that it's a sexually open relationship but between two people. And he argued that provided there was no deceit and no coercion, there's no reason in principle that marriage uh, relationships should be sexually exclusive. For some people, that's what gets the relationship off the ground. They need to have a sexually closed relationship. But for other people, their um, emotional union will actually be enhanced by having extramarital affairs. Um, and he was saying that, in principle, there's no reason to be against this, and that this is actually something that uh, these uh, uptight heterosexuals can get over and learn from the gay community, uh, that we're living in this bad Victorian era of ethics, and that we need to get over our fear of multiple partners. Uh, and then the last term is a wed lease. Uh, this was in the Washington Post just after the Supreme Court ruled on the two marriage cases, conveniently timed. And it was written by an attorney, and he said, um, wed lease is a play on the term wedlock. And wedlock connotes something that's permanent and stable and solid. You're locking in for life. And he said, wed lease, we could use this from contract law, from various other types of uh, um, law. You can lease a house. You can lease a car. Why not lease your spouse? And the idea here is that you would have expressly temporary marriage license, a five-year marriage license or a 10-year marriage license, and it can be renewed on good behavior. So if after five or 10 years, Sharif and Gabby are still going along fine and dandy, they can renew their wed lease. But why get a wedlock? Because the problem is that we, again, we have unrealistic expectations. Sharif thinks he can love Gabby for the rest of his life. And the argument here was that's unrealistic. That's just something out of a Jane Austen novel. Better to be realistic just pledged five years. If it goes well, renew. If it's not going well, you can get out. No harm, no foul, because you didn't have this unrealistic expectation in the first place. And again, once you sever the connection to the comprehensive union that Sharif was discussing, where it calls on comprehensive commitment, it's not clear what principle would require this sort of a commitment from spouses. But from the policy perspective, whatever you think about the morality of group marriage, throuples, of sexually open marriages, or of temporary marriages, think about the public policy consequence of this. Because for every additional sexual partner I have, and for the shorter-lived 
those sexual relationships are, the greater the chance that I create children with multiple wives or just with multiple women, may or may not be married to them in the case of the monogamous relationships. The more children I create with more women, the more my time is divided, the more my care, my attention, my love, my resources are divided between multiple households. It creates fatherless kids and fragmented families. So again, from the state's perspective of marriage, it's trying to get me to commit permanently and exclusively to one woman. It's not clear once you redefine marriage what principle and law would, would, would prevent the unraveling of marriage into the thruple and the monogamous relationships and the wed leases. In fact, this is already happening because one of the points that we make in the book is that the two visions of marriages uh, aren't just a new creation. Many uh, uh, opposite sex relationships are inspired by the revisionist conception of marriage that Sharif originally laid out, where love is what makes a marriage. In fact, it's the view of marriage that fueled the sexual revolution. The last thing I'll say, the third consequence, is for religious liberty. We've already seen in Massachusetts, in Illinois, and in Washington, D.C., where I currently live, that the government has forced Catholic charities out of the adoption agency business. And it had nothing to do with funding, so libertarian concerns. It just had to do with licensing. It's illegal to run an adoption agency or a foster care agency without a license. They would not give license to these institutions unless they agreed to place children with same-sex couples on an equal basis as with married mothers and fathers. Uh, the church in all three jurisdictions argued that they had social science that suggested that moms and dads are different and that kids do best with a mom and a dad, and they said they had the First Amendment that protected their religious liberty rights. In all three jurisdictions, the government said no and denied them uh, a license, and they shut their doors. This does nothing to advance the social justice claims of orphans. It does nothing to find more homes for these kids to shut down providers, especially when we already have bloated foster care roles. Uh, and then what we've seen since then uh, is with florists and bakers and innkeepers, um, uh, who have I left out? Florists and photographers in New Mexico most recently, in which these were uh, private businesses who had no problem serving gay and lesbian clients, but did have a problem using their God-given gifts and talents to celebrate a same-sex wedding. So in the state of New Mexico, Elaine Huguenin runs Elaine Photography. She had taken pictures, portraits, things like that for gays and lesbians since her business opened. When she was asked to take a picture of a same-sex commitment ceremony, she just referred them to a different photographer, and she was then sued under the New Mexico Human Rights uh, 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 violation, is what she was uh, charged with. She lost her initial case and had to pay a $7,000 fine. This then gets appealed all the way up to the New Mexico Supreme Court. That case was decided this past summer, back in August. And the court, in a concurring opinion, said the price of citizenship was that Elaine had to serve the same-sex couple to celebrate their same-sex wedding. It wasn't that religious liberty and the price of citizenship suggested that the lesbian couple go to a different photographer. It was that Elaine had to take these pictures herself or shut down her business. And that's what we're going to see as the logic of this plays out. And this, again, does nothing to advance the social justice claims for the least among us. It does nothing to help find homes with moms and dads. It does nothing to allow the church to do its work. The last thing I'll say, just in closing, and has nothing to do with the consequences, has to do with the uh, prudential argument about why continue to make this case in the public square. When Jody says, you know, he says he looks at the polls and it looks like we're making progress on the life issue but we're not making progress on the marriage issue. That's not surprising. Uh, for the past uh, 30 years, the forces in favor of redefining marriage have had a very well-organized, well-financed campaign, um, slowly working through the media, working through TV shows like Glee, Will and Grace, Modern Family, but also Beverly Hills 90210 and Melrose Place, various ways in which they were subverting a sound understanding of marriage and family life. They were well-funded, they got good politicians, they got good judges in various states, states that redefined marriage in surprising ways that you didn't think someone like Ohio, uh, uh, Iowa would be out in front of this. They had made sure they got the right panel of judges. Our side was very reluctant to engage on this issue. Uh, unlike the way Jody describes it, where like, the bishops are like rearing uh, this war against same-sex marriage, I actually think uh, the average Catholic and the average prelate has actually been reluctant to want to make an argument in the public square on this issue because it's a very nasty issue to get embroiled in. Um, it's a lot of name calling. Um, it's not a particularly fun topic to discuss over dinner when people say, oh, what do you do? It's like, oh, we wrote a book against gay marriage, right? It's not um, something that gets you the accolades of your colleagues. Um, I will never be a tenured professor because of this book. Like, there are certain consequences of the work that we do. But I think it's important that we do it 
And it's not surprising that right now the public opinion polls look against us. It's because we've been silent by and large. Our book is one of the first of its kind. Whereas on the pro-life side, 40 years ago, right after the Supreme Court issued the Roe v. Wade decision, public opinion polls looked pretty bad for pro-lifers. It was about a two to one spread, about 33 to 66% public opinion shortly after the Roe v. Wade decision. All of the elites said, oh, the younger generation, they're not with you. They're all in favor of abortion rights. And it'll just be these geriatrics and the Pope in Rome will be the last one speaking out in defense of life. And day after day, you had elite figures and public figures, people like Bill Clinton and Ted Kennedy and Al Gore and Jesse Jackson, who were pro-life. And then they evolved on this issue and became pro-choice. But then you had people 40 years ago who wrote the initial books on the pro-life movement, people like John Finnis and Hadley Arcus and Jermaine Grise and David Solomon. And then you had the public officials who were making public arguments about this, Ronald Reagan and Henry Hyde and Ed Meese. And then you had the think tanks and the organizations, National Right to Life, Americans United for Life, Susan B. Anthony List. They did all of this work over the course of 40 years in the face of lots of opposition. And now my generation is more pro-life than my parents' generation. We now see a majority of Americans, according to the latest Gallup polls, who identify as pro-life. We see that more Americans are opposed to the majority of abortions that take place in America. But none of this was inevitable. Had the Jody Bottoms of the world 40 years ago given up on the life issue and said, hey, we just finally got accepted as Catholics in America. JFK has just been elected president. We finally arrived. We got to give up this pro-life agitation. We would not be gathered here each year for the Ethics and Culture Conference with one of the most intellectually high firepowered pro-life conferences in America. It's because of what took place 40 years ago that we can now do this today. So my response to Jody is that there's no reason to give up, to have a premature surrender. It's not surprising that it looks pretty bad right now when the other side has more or less been uh, waging this campaign unresponded to for 30 years on the marriage question, and we're just now engaging. Let me just say, uh, Jody obviously is not here, and there's no one here that would uh, offer a brief response as Charles did raise questions and challenges to Sharif's comments, and, we'll, and we opened up the conversation. We'll have an opportunity to have a conversation amongst okay. ourselves and respond to the various strands of arguments that have been made. Let me just uh, stand in the shoes of Jody uh, and, and make a, an argument, uh, in, or just make a, a responsive claim to what, what Ryan was saying. Ryan was making a, a case about social justice for children. One of the facts that moved Justice Anthony Kennedy, it seems to have moved Justice Anthony Kennedy in his recent decision, is that in California alone there are tens of thousands of children who are currently the children of partnered same-sex couples. And, that, and that's a sort of brute fact that, uh, on the ground with respect to this debate. And justice, some might argue, would require the state to act in a way that shored up and stabilized those relationships for the sake of those children. That is to say um, that, uh, in fact, the, the fact that there are so many families, children and same-sex, uh, in, in, in coupled same -sex, uh, children coupled same-sex relationships, whether they be adopted or produced through assisted reproductive technologies, that, in fact, that, that, that cuts in the direction of actually enacting laws that shore up those relationships for the very same goods that Ryan was suggesting with respect to marriage, the state's interest in marriage being to create a stable platform wherein children can be raised with a mom and a dad and flourish at their maximum level. Now, a related argument would be, I suppose, that um, th that is the optimal scenario, two parents, one child, but in fact, the, but the law generally doesn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and why not allow a stabilizing legal regime for those, those unions that are, that are different from that? And the fact that we still have many regimes where adoption is permissible and certainly People can pursue their own self-help through assisted reproductive technologies to have uh, children in other ways in same-sex couples. So that, that's, that's one concern. The other idea is that actually I think a fundamental disagreement about the nature of, of, of law itself and, the, and, and such, such that a, a, a robust principle of autonomy would push in the direction of saying if you have, and this picks up on what Charles was suggesting earlier, if you do, if you posit that there is a, an intrinsic um, uh, orientation towards same-sex uh, attraction and 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 folks want to pursue these relationships, um, then then and they're not harming others. And this is a, obviously a, a contested matter. They're not harming others, but harming a child is different from producing a second best option for the child, right? Because you have to have a starting baseline of like what would be is it harming a child to raise him or her in a same sex home 
uh, compared to what, th th those are, it's a complicated question. Uh, in any event, the, uh, and I think what Jody and others would say is that the law, because we live in a pluralistic society, people have different conceptions of the, of the good, we should allow people space for private ordering so long as they don't hurt others uh, in a concrete way. That would be, I think, the, one of the arguments that would be, that would be made uh, in response. And the problem that Jody would suggest is, is pressing here in, in Super Bowl is that in order to explain to someone, as, as you all have, you know, what, what marriage is, or what, why uh, same-sex unions are not coherent as marriages, which is, is the position that you're suggesting, is that uh, to understand that, you have to understand so much, uh, you have such a thick sort of moral anthropology about human beings, the common good, that we're not simply individual wills that exist and to come together or separate the, in the ways that, that you were talking, describing no fault diverse, that, that starting with same-sex marriage seems, seems like uh, picking uh, discrimination against a, a socially disfavored group. And Justice Kennedy also raised concerns about animus and, um, and, uh, and stigmatizing people and singling them out and so on. Justice Kennedy, I should say, proceeded in his opinion as if there were no arguments that were rational against. And in fact, that's the basis for his judgment. Justice Alito explicitly mentioned your argument uh, in, in his sort of taxonomy of conceptions of marriage. So I think that a person in Jody's position would, would raise those uh, concerns, as Charles has raised some other arguments about the question of infertility and, 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 and other issues. There are obviously the rejoinders and, and surrebuttals and answers, and hopefully we'll get to all that. I think, the, I think what we should do is open up the floor to questions. I anticipate a lot of, those, a lot of that exchange can emerge in response to the questions. So let's proceed to the, to the, to the questions. Uh, there's supposed to be cards with questions written on them, and I will begin by reading the questions. So. While they're bringing up the questions, let me say, Sharif, um, Charles asked a question about infertility. Why is it that the law should, if the bodily union argument, if, the one, if a comprehensive union requires biologically complementary people who engage in a kind of act that can, can result in procreation, why, why do we allow infertile couples to get married? What, what's, sure. what would you say in response to uh, that? The short answer is it's still a comprehensive union. right? So the, the three elements were it's a union of heart, mind, and body that would be fulfilled by the bearing and rearing of children. That's what it's inherently oriented to. And in virtue of both of those things, calls for permanent and exclusive commitment. Well, it's still really a real bodily union because they do exactly the same thing that a couple does when they happen to be uh, fertile. In other words, there's just a spectrum between a couple on their wedding night, a, couple bef a year before their first child, a couple after the last child leaves for uh, college, and indeed in the case where there are no uh, children which is that they're actively coordinated together towards a single end of the couple as a whole. They do exactly the same thing that an opposite sex couple does that's fertile when they consummate. So for this reason, they have a, a, uh, a comprehensive union. It's oriented to, it would be fulfilled by the bearing and rearing of kids in a way that a best friendship or a roommate ship or something like that would not be. Uh, and for both of those reasons, it calls for total commitment. Now you might say, okay, well, so it might still match this sense of comprehensive union in some abstract way, but what social value does it have to recognize their relationships? Well, the first thing is, because it's a true comprehensive union, it can ground these comprehensive norms. We don't have the same harms of recognizing their relationship as a marriage. But we also have some distinctive benefits, right? The more these relations, the more comprehensive unions are modeled in society overall, the fewer children you will have who don't get to know the committed love of their own mother and father more broadly. And there's some distinctive benefit to recognizing a comprehensive union when it doesn't produce children, which also has social value. And that's this, that it teaches that marriage is not just a means to kids. It's not just an instrument for boosting SAT scores or getting more kids into Notre Dame. It's something that has value in itself. And that in fact, the instrumental value that it serves in terms of stability is best realized when people respect its inherent value. Charles, what, what's your, while we're still waiting, well, what's your uh, response to that? I, I want to quarrel first with this notion of comprehensive union. You said early on in, in, uh, in the first part of your talk that a total union is not possible with same-sex relations. Oh, who says? I mean, really, who says? Because, in fact, we, we, we have a, a, a developing body of science which suggests it is. 
And, and so we are posing what amounts to ipsy dixits against empirical evidence. And, and uh, I would, uh, you know, I have changed my mind on this, but I've changed my mind based on, uh, on empirical study, based on, on long and hard thought. And uh, the, the, the case against uh, same-sex marriage simply seems increasingly difficult to maintain because this notion of comprehensive union doesn't work. When you, def when you confine it to heterosexual relations, you've got to open it up. Professor Reed, so, I mean, you're familiar with the canon law on this, is that the same act, whether performed by a heterosexual or homosexual couple, wouldn't consummate a marriage unless it actually united them mm -hmm. as a two and fl one flesh union, comprehensive union that Sharif's described. What is the action that the same sex couple engages in that unites them comprehensively? How does the lesbian couple unite in this two and one flesh way? Well, I'll leave it to their designs, but I, I suspect that they have, you know, they, they have various uh, sexual uh, desires that get expressed in one or more different ways. Do we have to get down to the particulars of, of uh, I remember when I was uh, studying canon law, we had all these debates over verum semen. Uh, and do we have to get down to that level of, of detail? Well, so I think what, we do. Let me, here's, a, here's a way of... That's, that's the nature of what marriage is. Like, I mean, you have to define what the marital, you have to define what the marital act is. But one, so one thing that Professor use, Reed raised well, is the concern that there's a kind of circularity here. I just want to say a quick word about that. Um, it's not that we're saying that marriage is as such. The most basic thing you can say about it is that it's a heterosexual union. And then it turns out that anybody that's not a heterosexual union doesn't get included. We've given a general description of what makes for total union, including bodily union. We've made it by analogy to something totally different, which is the bodily union of parts within a single person. From that we say, the thing that makes the parts of one person, one body, is that they're actively coordinated towards a single end of the whole that they make up together. And then we look out and see, well, what matches that description? And only the opposite sex relationships can. I guess one way of putting the question that Ryan and I would have is, what is the general description of bodily union such that two men in a sexual relationship can achieve it, but not two men in another relationship? Or to put it in a way that's more related to your point, what is the empirical evidence that we have discovered? What's the specific empirical finding we've found that shows that while before we thought that two men couldn't become one flesh, now we know that they can be? No, I mean, so your question is uh, with respect, again, to the conjugal act, the sex act? Well, um, it's, I think one thing that's shared on both sides is that we think that one thing that makes marriage different is that it's a real bodily union oh, as well mm -hmm. as a unit out of other levels. And, and, I, and I suspect that, that uh, you would have other forms of intercourse uh, taking its place. So let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. So, Sharif, you have criteria. You and Ryan have criteria for the for what makes a comprehensive union. What, tell me. Let's walk through them. What they are. Sure. The first one. Just and just say the word. Don't explain it. You explained it. It was wonderful. Your explanation. Thank tell you. us. Tell us the word. Tell us the word. Uh, bodily union. Bodily. Let's, okay. Let's. Okay. So bodily. Let's leave that for last. Let's start okay. with the others. You're, you're thinking of act, good, and then commitments. Yeah. Uh, no. You're saying. You're saying monogamy. Oh, uh, right. The, the, the list of criteria that you've established. Yeah, yeah. Monogamy, permanence. Okay, monogamy. Okay, so, so monogamy, one could, one could achieve with the same sex couple. What's the next one? Permanence. Permanence, you could achieve with the same sex couple. What's the next one? Exclusivity. Sexual exclusivity. Right. Same thing. You could do that with the same sex couple. What's next? Well, so I mean, right, the foundation are, what, what, of all of this it, was total union. Right. It, okay, it's, okay. It's the oh, so it's not the commitment. sum of those things that Let equals me, total union? I think, I think I can put it in a different way. The main content, both sides want to say. Can I ask you just a sharpening question? Yeah. Uh, just a very quick. <laughs> the, the question is how the, the lynch, the, the thing that distinguishes, and I think this gets to Professor Reed's question, the thing that distinguishes a same sex union from, from a, a marriage between a man and a woman is the capacity to become a one flesh union. Is that the linchpin of your argument? Yes. That's the linchpin of your argument, right? Yes. So the, the, it's the in, incapacity which makes it an incoherent idea that there could be a marriage, the incapacity to form a one flesh union, which is only possible with two organisms with compatible reproductive, complementary reproductive systems that, and that you say, become one organism. That's your prince, that's, that's the main ingredient, that's the main distinguishing element, is it, am I, do I have that right? Yes. 
Okay. So, Professor Reed, what's, what would you say? Or I can I can volu I can anticipate I could construct a response to that since I'm standing in the shoes of the Jody or, or someone who's similarly situated. Mm -hmm. I would say, well, I think that is that's the sort of who who defines that. Why is that yeah. significant? Where does that right, right. come so, from? And it gets to the heart of the, the the conference, right? It's a kind of claim about normativity of biological complementarity. Let me make well, the best case yeah, put, for the. So, wait, sorry, go ahead. Well, let, let, let's go ahead this way. The same sex attraction is a naturally occurring human variability. It's something certain people are simply inclined to do. And given their, their inclinations, they may, may find non-conforming, shall we say, ways of, of engaging in intercourse. And uh, through the process of these non-conforming acts, they consummate marriage in the same way and mean as much as do anyone else. I mean, finally, again, it comes down to appreciating the fact that this is an expression not uh, of some aberrance, but of human, natural human variability that I think we, the time has come to recognize in law. I think so I have an on-point response. Yeah, go ahead. So here's the best case, I think, for saying that two men can form a comprehensive union. They can have a bodily union because they can have uh, free and loving sexual activity. And that sexual activity, what? It both fosters and expresses deep affection. That's the distinctive value that it has. That's what it adds to their relationship. That's how it embodies it. And the whole thrust of my argument on the case against the revisionist view, is that if that's what sex is contributing, expressing and fostering affection, then you can't explain any other aspect of marriage. Non-sexual activities can foster and express affection. You can foster and express among three people. It doesn't have to be permanent if affection isn't permanent. It doesn't have to be exclusive if affection is fostered by sexual but activity. But now, now you're thrown right back to the argument that, uh, that I raised regarding the infertile couple, because now, now you're right back there. So, and here's the thing that sex can do, whether or not it produces a child, in the opposite sex case. Besides fostering and expressing affection, it can make the two one flesh in this sense. What is unity? This is an Aristotelian idea. It's not a Catholic idea. What's unity? Unity is coordination. It's activity towards a common end. And unity of persons is valuable in itself, even when you don't produce the end. In a university setting, if you're pursuing the truth together in a particular class, it's that pursuit, that coordination towards a common end together that unites you. It's valuable even if you don't figure out the answer. In the bodily context, what's bodily union? Coordination towards a single bodily end. There's only one bodily end that two people have to coordinate towards. That's reproduction. And so in the coordination itself, they have a bodily union. And if it's expressing a union of hearts and minds, it's a comprehensive union. And if unions of persons have value in themselves, then that union has a distinctive value in itself, even when children don't result. And that's why at common law, as well as canon law, and in the thought of these ancient Greek and Roman thinkers as much as in you know, Moses and Jesus, an act that makes marital love seals the relationship, has that distinctive value, even if it doesn't produce children. And as your work very helpfully pointed out, if, if a man found out that his wife was infertile or vice versa, that was no ground for annulment because they had become one flesh because the union mattered in itself. What made it a union was the coordination towards an end, but not the realization of the end itself. And is it right, and you all are all and have studied the canal, is, is it also right to say that the, the incapacity of a spouse to perform the conjugal act, not to produce an issue, but to perform it was, was in fact deemed to be grounds for annulment? Yes. Is yes. That, is that, that Still correct? is. Okay. So can, can I jump back real quick? Yeah, of course. I think you, Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think earlier when Carter said that both same-sex and opposite-sex couples are capable of forming monogamous, sexually exclusive, and permanent relationships, that, that actually obscures the point that Sharif and I and Robbie make in our book. We don't deny that same-sex couples can form a monogamous, permanent, exclusive relationship. We say that there's nothing about the relationship as such that requires such commitments. And that's why I was suggesting that it's actually the analysis, the Aristotelian analysis of acts, goods, and then norms or commitments that explains why the conjugal view of marriage shows why those commitments are actually required to get a marriage up and going. That it's precisely because only, it's precisely because sexual complementarity is the foundation for the monogamy, the exclusivity, and the permanency as requirements of the relationship. Because only a man and a woman can unite in the type of act that intrinsically is oriented towards creating new life. 
and that that then explains why it calls for these commitments. That's why when I asked Professor Reed, you know, what is the action that the lesbian couple is engaging in that unites them in a monogamous relationship that the thruple couldn't engage in? Because the type of act that unites the man and the woman as husband and wife is something that only two people can engage in. It unites them as a single organism in the way that Sharif described. And there's no complementary action like that once you open it up just to saying that it's whatever enhances emotional or romantic uh, or dispositional effective so, union. So, uh, and that, that's why I'm saying there's a principle. Yeah, let me ask you a question. So here. an opposite, a, 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 a man and a woman who decide to get married but resolve never to have sexual intercourse with one another, is that a marriage? This is a Josephite marriage. So it's a non, so, 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 I mean, it's a non-consummated, it's a non-actualized marriage, but it's the commitment that gets the relationship up and going. It never actually uh, uh, reaches its telos, actualized or embodied. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's, it's something that would be uh, uh, capable of dissolving. Uh, so it's an inchoate, incom uncompleted marriage is what you're yeah. saying. So here's a question, here's the qu this, and this is for Ryan. So you all have articulated uh, a, a, an anthropological understanding of, of, uh, of, of human sexuality, uh, marriage, that is, that is that, that as you, I won't recapitulate what you said, and as defined, it is only applicable to couples, uh, individuals of the, of the opposite sex. I, a question regarding public policy or law would be, we live in a pluralistic society. You have a, a compelling, well-articulated account of what marriage is. Why should the state uh, adopt that view of marriage as opposed to another view of marriage, or at least give people space for private ordering in such a way that same-sex couples, perhaps with children, can, can have the benefits of marriage to stabilize their relationship and, and so on? Why, why is it the case that your, if we even, if we posit that your argument is, represents the sort of perfect understanding of, of marriage, why should the state in a pluralistic society make the perfect the enemy of the good, which means that certain couples won't have access to benefits, as Susie Orman pointed out to you in your debate with Piers Morgan. Uh, they, they're they, they would not have the benefit, very real benefits, of, of, a, of a union like that. What would, what's the response to that? Sure. I mean, I think we don't want to make uh, the perfect the enemy of the good, but we also don't want to make the good something that completely undermines the message of marriage. So, let me, so, so I yeah. mean, the argument that was made with no-fault divorce was that, <coughs> yes, marriage should be a permanent relationship. We have lots of people who are in bad marriages, and if we could just make divorce easier, it would end up uh, being a benefit to children and to women who are trapped in bad marriages. And what we saw with the sociologists, normally the way that academic change takes place is that older academics die, and then younger academics come up, and they have new <laughs> ideas, and that's how you get academic change. We actually saw a generation of social scientists who thought no-fault divorce would be a good idea uh, precisely for these types of reasons you're discussing. We live in a pluralistic society. Let's have more visions of what marriage is on the table. They then looked at the data and said this was an unmitigated nightmare, particularly for women and for children, the precise people who they were most interested in helping. I don't think anyone denies that uh, divorce reform, marriage reform is necessary. I think the type we got with no-fault divorce uh, didn't actually achieve that purpose. So the question here is that if you were to redefine marriage to, to recognize the pluralistic values of our society, what would your limiting principle be? And that's the question that I'd also place to Jody. Uh, when you uh, responded to me in the persona of Jody earlier, you said, provided it's not har harming anyone, and it's a committed, loving, consensual relationship, why can't they get a marriage license? I think that's true for the thruple, that's true for the wed lease, that's true for the monogamous relationship. At which and what point if there's, what just, if there's, what if, yeah, go ahead. I think at, at which point you've just I, I, eliminated I, 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 the conception I, I, of marriage I, I, from I, I, law. You've just dissolved it into contract. Go ahead. I, I will raise an objection there because I think, in fact, you can draw some bright lines. And I think you, you can do that precisely in, let's say, the monogamish marriage. And, and uh, because that uh, now opens the door to something that, that uh, does uh, look to be socially harmful, does look to gi uh, give injury to others. That is, uncertainty of parenthood uh, is an issue there. Uh, a gateway, perhaps, to polygamy. I mean, now you're raising serious, uh, you know, you can draw a bright line there. You can say the monogamish relationship is not something we want to sanction at law, but a, a, an exclusive and permanent uh, same-sex relationship that has all of the, the attributes uh, we associate with marriage that, on the other hand, we'll, we'll recognize. Uh, I, I, you know, the, the slippery slope argument I, I finally find unconvincing because we run into the, the, these problems. The, 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 the problem of monogamish, of, of, of all, you know. 
this, we can draw those lines. On what principle? I mean, I, I heard you social just say harm. we can draw social, social harm. harm. So you're going to de de deprive me of my natural rights based upon a social harm argument? I thought natural rights were trumps. Yeah, because so, you, so if you're denying me my constitutional right to equality under the law by not letting the three of us, our thruple, be recognized as a marriage, for what, for what reason? What social harm are the three the, of us going to well, cause? The, so, the social harm is simply that uh, you do have uncertainty of parenthood. Uh, I don't think the three of us are going to have any kids. Well, the three of you. I mean, maybe there's new science that you know of, but uh, I haven't seen it yet. But no, the, the, <laughs> Professor Reed's point, though, is that, I mean, we have, we, I mean, the, uh, the, 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 it'll be interesting to see whether or not the arguments that Justice Kennedy found persuasive in the Supreme Court cases this past term will push in the direction, and there are those, especially those in, in certain elements of the fundamentalist Latter-day community, uh, Latter-day Saints uh, folks, that are, that are pushing to reopen the question mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of polygamy, and they have a, a, not just a, a, a sort of an emotional case for it, but a religiously based case for it. Uh, and then the question becomes, and, and, and traditionally the argument has been that the social harms that are associated with polygamy are significant enough to constrain the individual rights of those who wish to uh, pursue it. So, um, uh, but so, so this is, by the way, I've, been, I've read all the questions and we're integrating them into our conversation, so don't feel as though your question hasn't been answered. The one that hasn't been asked is the last one, and that's this one. That is, uh, for, the, for the panel, um, do you see any value in having two types of classes of marriage, or perhaps, and I'll refine it a little bit, marriage and civil unions, perhaps if you want to retain the pedagogical significance to signal what the, the most socially beneficial relationship is by your lights, call that marriage, but then for the sake of these children who are in same-sex unions, uh, for the sake of uh, those, if, if the state decides that in fact in, in, in encouraging and, 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 and emotional connections and, and stability are, are, are goods that the state should pursue using its coercive authority, or not just coercive, but inducements in terms of tax benefits and so forth as well, uh, incentives rather. Um, what, what about that? What about the idea of adopting a bifurcated approach, adopting a new category of union that receives benefits that are being sought but is not called marriage. That's what California had, and then the court declared it unconstitutional. I mean, so that's the simple answer: is that California well, you're had. Saying, so the answer, civil so just to be clear, your answer is that it, it's unsustainable because what will happen is it will all become marriage. That that's your answer. Well, no, I mean you cut me off before I finished. But. I apologize. Please, <laughs> I'm okay. sorry about that. Yeah, go ahead. So, so I mean, this is what California had, um, and I think the, they were trying to find this compromise solution, which I don't think anyone thinks is ideal. So I would say that Sharif and I would say that there are problems with. Uh, picking out one type of consenting adult relationship for the label civil union. And is this, will this just be understood as marriage light? What will be the limiting principles for that as uh, your civil union legislation? I think people on the other side were saying, this is just creating separate but equal, which is inherently unequal. And so I think it ended up being unstable because neither side was ultimately happy the court redefined it. But I think the, the, the ultimate concern here, and Justice Kennedy says, well, what about there are a couple thousand kids in California being raised by same sex couple. I think it was 60 or 40,000, was it not? I think he anyway, said 40. 40,000, yeah. yeah, go ahead. So, 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 so the question is, what do you want to do in policy for those children? And, and I think this is a, actually a hard question because there are lots of children who are being raised in non-marital families and we have to have a variety of mechanisms to help them. But I think we shouldn't be short-sighted about what it does when you redefine marriage in this case. Because we've already seen in California, they now have the opposite, or they're pushing to have the opposite. It's been introduced, it hasn't been passed of the HHS mandate. Think about the contraception mandate. This is a mandate that every health insurance plan covers contraception. In the case of California, they have a bill on the table that will mandate cover of conception, uh, including conception for infertile couples, including same-sex couples, who after a year of trying, if they can't conceive a child, will be eligible for fertility treatments, which every healthcare plan in the state of California has to provide. And so now you have to ask, what's being incentivized here? It's not incentivizing the less than 1% of California children who are currently being raised by same-sex couples, but it's going to be the creation of an entire class of children from the get-go who will be deprived of relationship with either their mother or their father. And so I think this is why we have to think longer term about how ideas have consequences. If you say that the same-sex relationship is the equivalent of a marriage and that every marriage under the health care law has to have access to reproductive technologies if they're experiencing infertility, and if every same-sex marriage by definition will be infertile, they're then gonna be covered for these fertility treatments, which will then increase the number of kids who are not being raised by their mother and their father. 
And so, so that's how I think about this. I think it's, what, what's the long term? It's a prudential. We, we're we're need already that. over time, but did there's you a related point, which is that if there are concrete needs that arise in households with kids, then we should meet them in every household with kids. Which means that we won't be limiting ourselves to households led by two men or two women in a sexual relationship. There are all kinds of non-marital households, se some romantic sexual led, some not. And we're gonna, if, if it's a tax credit for education, justice would not require giving that just if the kid happens to be in a home where two women are having sex or two men are having sex. Justice would require giving it on an equal basis. And the further benefit of that is that it wouldn't create a kind of marriage light, a sort of parallel marriage that uh, that undermines these norms, if, if only in a stepwise fashion. Which actually was the case with the Defense of Marriage Act case. So Edie Windsor was in a same-sex relationship, yeah. married in Canada, and it was over the estate tax. And our position was just abolish the estate tax. It's much so, simpler than so, redefining uh, marriage. <laughs> Professor Reed, do you have any further things you'd like to, well, I'm about to terminate the, oh. uh, the conversation. Uh, as, uh, if Professor Reed, if you'd like to add anything. Well, I, I ju I'd just like to say then thank you. And um, regarding the issue of same-sex marriage, I, I do, I, I, I'll make one point, Ryan, uh, to you. That's, uh, the pro-life movement is successful, I think, has been increasingly su uh, successful over the last few decades. I think because the weight of scientific evidence now indicates that the fetus really is a living human entity. We may not, it's uh, not fully born, not fully developed, but certainly evidence suggests this. You do uh, medical procedures, medical interventions, you do this all the time on a developing fetus. You, you, uh, uh, you, you, you're moving backwards uh, the threshold of viability, all of this. All of this is pointing clearly in favor of, of life. And I, and I think that is the reason that the pro-life movement is more successful now than 1974. The opposite is true regarding same-sex relations. Science is moving increasingly to see this, in fact, unanimously to see this as natural variability, social uh, studies, social science studies, though they're, they're, they, by definition, they must be relatively new and, and fairly uh, confined suggest that same-sex relations are at least as stable as heterosexual relations. Children emerge from same-sex relations. Uh, the American Psychological Institute, the American Psychiatric Association, uh, all, all concur on this, that children emerge uh, just as well, and, and with uh, very few gender identity issues uh, from same-sex relations. Uh, okay, thank you all to the panelists. Uh, it's, uh, I, what, I'm, what I'm proud of here is that we've had a, a charitable, thoughtful, engaging, spirited exchange about a very vexed subject matter. So please give a, a round of applause to our <laughs> panelists. And let me finally say, this concludes the 2013 uh, Fall Conference. Mark your calendars, October 30th to November 1st. Next year will be our Fall Conference. We hope to see you again. And please join us outside. And let me say a final uh, word of thanks to my staff, uh, to Harriet Baldwin and to all of you uh, for making it a successful event. Thank you very much and we'll see you outside.